Being in the World, Part 1 The Story of Everybody's Life Ontology, the Science of Beingness, reveals deep insights about the nature of human life and experience. An ontological analysis of the human condition, our way of being, shows that our everyday social relations give us a particular kind of preoccupation with the world. This care about the world involves us in a network of conditions and actions we do not choose, leading us away from our authentic self. Look up ontology. Not just in the dictionary, or not only in the dictionary, but also on Wikipedia and on some philosophy sites. Get some background. Ontology is not well understood, and there's a reason for that. It is omitted from the curriculum of all government-sponsored schools. Don't believe me? Look up John Taylor Gatto, and uh, he'll give you the background on that. How the school system was designed and why it was designed to be the way it is. Uh, they're trying to train up compliant factory workers. That's the program. So you get trained to be a factory slave for over 12 years of your life, and you never looked into the design philosophy of the institution that you spent your childhood in? You need to remedy that. Real beingness is based on experience. Real knowledge is not coming from external authorities. They will only tell you what they want to tell you or what they want you to know to benefit them. Real knowledge is based on being, not knowing, not thinking, not doing, and certainly not having. For example, if somebody gives you a title, uh, you are the manager of so-and-so department, that's not your being. That's something you have. And even if you do it well, that still doesn't affect who you are. So you could be a success at it, and it would not be at all rewarding because it's not really who you are. So we have to learn about being. We have to learn about ontology. Now, we're using the word care in a very specific definition here. Unfortunately, our Western language does not have a good vocabulary for talking about being. So uh, Heidegger defined the word care as our default way of being in the world. And a little bit later in the series, we'll give you a definitive ontological structural definition for that term. Our problem is that we give up, we actually sacrifice our authentic being on the altar of getting along in the world of the other. And that means we give up who we really are to imitate something external to get rewards. It's convenient. It's easier, or we think it's easier, than being our authentic self. But of course, it's not satisfying. It's not going to make us happy. And it's not going to make us successful, because when we imitate, we become a slave. We become passive. And you can't be successful. You can't win in life by imitating. Real success comes from being, not knowing, not thinking, not doing, and certainly not from having. There are so many people who have a lot of money, and they're miserable. Uh, there are so many people who have so many degrees, lots of letters after their names, or who are big thinkers, and they're miserable. They're not happy. They're certainly not a success, as we define success, which means being all that you can be. So this seminar is going to be about ontology, as a background for authenticity and integrity. But this situation, if taken in a specific way, also permits us to investigate our human condition firsthand. Wise men down through the ages have taught that a properly performed phenomenological inquiry into human beingness can bring us to a unified ontological model of human existence, in which we at last find ourselves at home with ourselves. This realization of authentic beingness is the actual goal of human life, 
toward which we are relentlessly driven by the anxiety arising from falling from our real self into the world. You have to change your being. If you want to be a successful person, you have to change your being from being a slave, from being passive, to creating. And you can't do that by thinking or knowing, or even by having or doing. You have to be the kind of person that creates stuff, that makes things happen. Nobody can do this for you. We can't give you some information and then you just duplicate that information and suddenly you're a success. No, it's not going to work. We have to begin this process of phenomenological inquiry. Look up phenomenological. Again, not just in the dictionary, but in philosophy sites that specialize in these topics. Get some background on phenomenological inquiry. It means looking into our experience, seeing what's really there. Not just taking somebody's word for it, but verifying everything in our own life. You have to look for yourself to find the phenomena we talk about in your own experience. Otherwise, it's not going to be yours. Don't take what we say as knowledge, as information. Take it as an opportunity to look in yourself, look at your own life, and find what we're talking about in your experience. And if you can't find it, then create it. When you attain a unified model, of human existence, an ontological model, that means you have attained complete self-realization. And what that means is eternal individuality. We're going to be explaining these concepts as we go along. These are very advanced concepts. Don't have time to cover them completely now. But just know that without ontology, there's no way to attain these goals. We want you to feel at home with yourself. That means we're grounded in our own field of consciousness and activities, grounded in our real being, who we really are, who nobody else could be. That's authentic beingness. When you are something that no one can imitate. Falling into the world. We are not alone. To exist means to be in relationship. Even to be alone implies the possibility of being in relation with others. In being with others, we typically maintain ourselves in the being of the other. That is, we see ourselves in the mirror of our actions and relations with others in the world. We lose our real self in this fundamentally inauthentic mode of being, because none of these mirrors are true. They all reflect a distorted and incomplete image of our real self. If you exist, you are in relation to other beings, to things, to processes, to the world. And the process is that we lose our real self in the world because the world overwhelms us. It makes us passive. It makes us an object instead of a person. We lose so many of our actual capabilities uh, because, we're again, we're imitating externally instead of creating internally. So you have to create your own prosperity by creating your being as a person who wins. How can you win if you're not being authentic? How is it possible? If you're not being your real self, you will not have all your energy available. You will not have your complete intelligence or all your talents. You will not be able to access the controls that determine who you are. Nobody can do this for you. No one sees you as you really are. And in our default state of being, you don't even see yourself as you really are. You see yourself in terms of the other, in terms of the categories and boundaries set by the others who fill our space up with false claims about who we are. So our everyday mode of being, as we actually experience ourselves, is being in the world. We are not spectators of life from some transcendental perspective, but deeply involved in it. We cannot meaningfully conceive of our being apart from the world in which we exist. 
Indeed, the world is the context that gives our being its meaning and value. Yet we become overwhelmed and lose ourselves in the complex relations and reactions of living in the world. In this condition, how can we recover our authentic being? Dualism means a fixed way of being. Dualism has been the default philosophical model for at least the last two or three thousand years. Dualism leads us to accept a fixed way of being. There's us and the world. And who's going to win? Of course, the world. The world is bigger than we are. It's stronger. It's more complicated. It has more resources. We're involved in the world. We're in relationship. And that means that we have to care about it, even though we don't get to choose the circumstances. That's part of the horror of being in the world that we don't get to choose the situations, but we have to care, and we have to make them turn out right, whatever that means to you. That's the context in which we live that gives our life its meaning and value. Unfortunately, the context is determined or controlled by the world. Thinking about it will not help. Thinking about it only makes it worse, because then we get a whole bunch of claims that aren't grounded in anything real. The only real solution is changing our being. Changing our being means coming back to our original self. And that requires a process because in the world, our default being is inauthentic. So we have to find our authentic being because we lose ourselves by identifying with externals. Well, you go to the movies. You see some hero, some action movie, and then you walk out of there feeling like a million bucks because you identify with something external. But that's not really you. You have to find your real self, and that's only possible with a phenomenological process. One of the meanings is in the first person, on the field, not in the third person or from the stands like a commentator. That's how we can recover our authentic being. The answer to this question begins from asking how relating to ourselves and others inauthentically, in which we fail to find ourselves and so fail to achieve genuine individuality, shows up in our clearing, the space of consciousness that we are. Our ontological analysis of worldly inauthenticity focuses on three phenomena of being in the world, idle talk, curiosity, and ambiguity. The problem in recovering our authentic being is that we don't know that we are being inauthentic. That's the reason you need a course to remind you of all these things, why you don't just realize them for yourself. And the reason we don't know is that we are identified with externals, objects, and labels. Uh, we're identified with our car, with our job, uh, with our name, with our family, with our country, with our cause. And this is inauthentic. And this relating shows up as phony. We're all phonies because we're not being our real self. And this shows up in our clearing. We are a clearing. We're not a thing. We're a space. We're an emptiness where everything shows up. The whole world shows up. Everybody and everything up to God shows up in our clearing. So what are we? How big are we? Just try to understand what we're capable of. We can create anything. But because we're addicted to the various symptoms of inauthentic being, such as idle talk, curiosity, and ambiguity, the convenience of inauthentic being outweighs the benefits of authentic being, at least in our warped thinking. Idle talk. Idle talk includes any communication outside of the ontic conversation, the inquiry into the authentic nature of our being as a discourse of phenomenological self-reflection. We examine our life not according to some superimposed external system of values, but how we actually experience it. This essay is an example of a disciplined ontic conversation. Idle talk is typical average everyday linguistic communication. The ontic conversation. Look it up. Ontic is different from ontological. Ontic means what can be. 
versus ontological, which means what is. So we have to have this ontic conversation or begin this ontic conversation because idle talk obscures what is genuinely ours, what is our real being. The ontic conversation is about the possibilities of being. Ontic means what can be. Right now we're in an authentic being, but we have a possibility for authentic being. How do we get there? Phenomenological self-reflection. That's the process that reveals what is really there in the world and in us. If you know how to use this process, your actual experience can teach you everything you need to know. All communication displays a triple ontological structure. A subject, the topic or speaker. An object, what the conversation is about. And a relation, the speaker's claim about the object. Now we're going to introduce a very important concept, the ontological triple. Look it up. If you don't look up these special terms, you will not get the benefit of the material. So go find a good source on ontology and look up triples. The w3c.org World Wide Web Consortium has a very good section on triples. Ontological analysis means finding triples. That's all there is to ontological analysis. The subject, the object, and the relation. All of our experience exhibits this triune structure. Consciousness, the object of consciousness, and the relation between ourself and whatever we're looking at. To analyze your experience ontologically, all you have to do is find the triples in your own experience. The unit of ontological structure is the triple, a triune entity usually consisting of subject, object, and relation. The figure at right represents an ontological triple with the vectors of subject, object, and relation. The triple mirrors the structure of perception and is the basic unit of ontological scientific notation. OWL, RDF, and similar formal ontological languages. Look up OWL. Look up RDF. Again, the w3c.org site is a very good source of information for this. The world is based not on monism, not on duality, but on trinity, on the triple. The triple structure is necessary for existence, for consciousness and experience. Without it, we don't have consciousness, we don't have existence, we don't have anything. So the triple structure is the basic structure of the universe and everything in it. In idle talk, our concern for the claim eclipses our concern for its object. In inauthentic communication, rather than trying to achieve genuine access to the object as it is, we focus on what is claimed about it. We take it for granted that what is said is true, without taking a good look at the object, simply because it was said. Worse, we pass it on, disseminate the claim, allow it to influence other conversations about the object, and so on. Idle talk obscures the reality. The more we engage in it, the less sense of what's really going on we're going to have. All worldly communication is idle talk, because the world is superficial and inauthentic. As soon as you accept the claims, or what to speak of repeating them, you're spreading the pollution of illusion. All idle talk, that means a conversation that's not rooted in real phenomena, is simply useless abstraction, talking about words. We thereby lose touch with the original object of the conversation. Our talk becomes ungrounded, empty of the authentic being of the object. We are no longer talking about the object, but about a linguistic abstraction of it. Because we seem to ourselves to understand the object, the convenience of talking about an abstraction seduces us into thinking we understand the object when we actually don't. So idle talk is just a waste of time. Linguistic abstractions and the models made from them and the various logical 
processes that we can subject them to are just fantasy. The reason we engage in them is that we are seduced by the convenience of abstractions. It's much easier to talk about words than to get into the reality of the subject. So we think we understand the object because we have words about it. But actually, we only know the claim. By conveniently providing the illusion of complete understanding, idle talk closes off its objects rather than revealing them. It also discourages the possibility of future investigation of the object, because, after all, we already know all about it. This impersonal, uprooted misunderstanding, often characterized by frequent misuse of the word they, dominates our everyday relations with ourselves, the world, and others, guaranteeing that we will remain inauthentic and far from actual individuality. Everything we think we know is just a claim, because idle talk is just about words. Idle talk guarantees that you will not understand what you're talking about. You will not be able to apply it. It is not grounded. It's not real knowledge. It's simply speculation, abstraction. This leads to impersonalism, treating people as objects. You've been treated as an impersonal object. How did you like it? Huh? You've also done it to others. So we have to see that it's not they, it's not the world that is doing it to us, whatever it might be for you. We're trained to do it to ourselves by schooling, by the pressure of society, and by so many other people who insist on some external standard for our behavior. Curiouser and Curiouser Such an uprooted understanding of the world is detached from any particular task that might focus us upon objects as they are in themselves. Thus the term idle talk. This type of conversation tends to float away from our immediate environment towards the distant, the alien, and the exotic. And if the focus of idle talk is the novel, its primary concern tends to be with its novelty. All we have in the world is claims about claims about claims. None of it is based on actual experience or evidence. Any unverifiable claim is only curiosity. It's just hearsay. It's not a basis of uh, evidence that we can use to actually get things done. That's why it's called idle talk. It doesn't have anything to do with any real work. There are many false claims floating around, and they only benefit the persons and organizations that make them. There's a lot of propaganda in the world. There's a lot of disinformation. You have to learn how to rely only on your own experience. Otherwise, you get caught up in nonsense like conspiracy theorizing, which is a perfect example of curious idle talk. Thus, we continually seek new objects of conversation, not in order to grasp them in their reality, but merely to stimulate ourselves with their newness, so we seek novelty with increasing force and velocity. We become compulsively curious, constantly distracted by new possibilities, and lingering on each topic for shorter and shorter periods. Our attention span atrophies as we constantly seek new stimulation. Floating everywhere, we dwell nowhere. But we keep getting seduced by novelty. Huh? What's the news? Heard anything new today? Uh, Facebook is a perfect example. Channel surfing on TV is another great example. It's nothing but media sensationalism. The new, the novel, the alien, the exotic, the far away. But being seduced by media results in a hypnotic alpha state where we're detached from our experience and we're seeing everything in terms of externals. Being systematically detached from our environment by a swelling tide of abstractions, we cannot distinguish genuine comprehension from counterfeit. 
The convenience of idle talk means that vapid slogans, pithy quotes, and ten-second sound bites replace reasoned analysis and discussion of every subject. Thus, in the world, superficial understanding is universally acclaimed as deep, and real understanding looks eccentric and marginalized. This habit of curiosity sabotages in-depth discussion of any topic, but deep study is required for competence and excellence. You are not going to be a success unless you are very, very good at something. You have to seek out the authentic sources because they provide some real substance, not just empty claims. Unfortunately, we are trained by the media, by school, and by other people to reject deep knowledge uh, because they don't want to see uh, that they're stupid. So anybody that shows up as being smart gets hassled. That allows them to retain the illusion that they understand, but actually all they have is idle talk. This superficiality is not deliberate. What intelligent individual would plan such a monstrous misunderstanding? But in a social world dominated by idle talk and curiosity, it permeates the environment. It creates a general mood of groupthink, our inheritance from our fellows and culture, into which we always find ourselves thrown. You think that the government is in control? Do you think that big business is in control? No. You think the bankers are in control? Heck no. They are all victims. No one is actually in control. No human being, anyway. So on the human level, there is no real controller, although certain people and organizations like to pose as the controller. This means that you can take control of your life, your environment, your meaning, your identity, because everybody else is in illusion. The whole world is just a big illusion machine run by curiosity and idle talk. Everybody is full of groupthink. They've been trained by school, advertising, news, entertainment, media. You can rise above this. You can become a success. But you're going to have to change your being. The feeling of falling. These three interconnected existential characteristics, idle talk, curiosity, and the ambiguity of superficiality, reveal a basic kind of everyday being common to all of us, falling into the world. We become lost in the public world of the others. We fall away from our authentic selves and lose the potential for being with integrity, wholeness. These three symptoms of idle talk, curiosity, and the ambiguity that results from them destroys real meaning. All we have is unverifiable claims. We can never be sure whether they're right or wrong. So we lose ourselves in a jungle of meaningless idle talk. We don't know what's right, what's wrong, what's true, what's false. It's all ambiguous. We have to find a new standard for integrity, and that means wholeness, being complete and whole as a person, a human being in the full sense of the word, with all of the qualities and activities of a human being. It doesn't refer to some arbitrary external moral standard. In short, our average everyday being shows up as inauthentic. We are uprooted from any genuine concern for the world and fellow human beings by our absorption in idle talk. We waste our precious time indulging in meaningless entertainment instead of taking action to change ourselves and improve the world. In the process, we are also uprooted from any genuine self-understanding. Thus, we cannot grasp which possibilities are genuinely our own, as distinct from possibilities that anybody can have. In the world, inauthentic being is the norm. If you try to become authentic, you'll be punished. You have to have a support network. That's what we provide. People waste years of their lives playing computer games, and one day the company goes under, and that's the end of the whole thing. It's happened so many times now, you think it's not going to happen again? Don't waste your time. Or you become an anybody person, 
An anybody person means someone who only has access to possibilities that are available to anyone. Anyone can go down to the store and buy stuff. Huh? You have 150 different varieties of toilet paper lining the shelves. Is that really choice? No, it's not an authentic choice because it doesn't come from you. Anybody can choose them. Anybody can go down and buy a car. Anybody can drive on the roads. Anybody can watch TV or play video games. What are the things that only you can be? That's your authentic being. And that's what we're here to help you find. Falling into detachment from genuine self-understanding permeates our philosophies as well as our everyday life. Indeed, human beings, for whom an understanding of their own being is natural, often accept philosophical traditions that systematically repress any real understanding of authentic being. Thus, instead of relentlessly pursuing the phenomenological methodology of ontic self-reflection that leads to authentic being, we content ourselves with convenient, prepackaged designations and rules for being and action made by others that have nothing to do with who we are for ourselves. Philosophy is not going to help you, because most philosophy is inauthentic and it represses our authenticity. They want us to subscribe to some ism and give us an arbitrary set of beingness and rules, what you're allowed to be and what you're not allowed to be. Though people accept these rules, they were made by others long ago, far away, in some completely different circumstance, in some completely different culture and time. They're irrelevant. They cannot guide our behavior today. They're just authority not real self-awareness. Any real philosophy is going to be based on self-awareness and your experience. Otherwise, it's just going to lead you astray. Various philosophies tend to interpret human beingness as if people were non-living objects. Such ontological errors naturally emerge both from absorption in practical tasks and from the peculiar necessities of philosophical speculation. In our everyday work, Inanimate objects lie temptingly available as paradigms of existence. When things need to be done, it is overwhelmingly convenient to treat human beings in the same way. Similarly, in theoretical contemplation, both objects and human beings appear as abstract models, completely detached from their contexts. Such objectification and elementalism are simply convenient shortcuts to ostensibly practical but erroneous conclusions about our beingness. Look up elementalism and objectification. Again, not just in the dictionary. For these two terms, we recommend General Semantics by Alfred Korzybski. We accept the authority of different philosophies because of convenience. We don't want to have to think through the whole thing ourselves. But guess what? Thinking is not going to do it. Thinking is not going to make us successful in life. Being is going to make us successful. Anything else is just abstraction, just a convenient shortcut to a model that's based on some impersonal concept. So philosophy based on abstract models is always wrong. Why? Because it's not based on our experience. It's not personal. Because of our inherent relatedness and our tendency to lose ourselves in the other, once such misinterpretations become established in philosophical discourse, succeeding generations tend to accept them unquestioningly as self-evident truths, as tradition, what everybody knows, or common sense. Tradition is idle talk. We accept it because it's convenient. So-called common sense is the same. Idle talk based on convenience. Ditto with everybody knows. Huh? What everybody knows is illusion. What everybody knows is inauthenticity. What everybody knows is a lie. And the same with abstract philosophy. It looks good on paper. Or like Yogi Berra said, in theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they're different. Another type of philosopher rejects common sense in favor of ever more novel, even bizarre hypothetical constructions. 
Perhaps their theoretical convolutions confer upon their adherents a thrill of astonishment at the exotic products of their intellectual advancement. But despite their revolt against common sense, they are no less slaves to the consensual hallucination of the world. And if you say, okay, I'm going to be a skeptic, I'm going to be a rebel, I'm going to reject everything. Well, guess what? Rejection is a mode of acceptance. You have to accept and acknowledge the reality of something before you can reject it. About the philosophers who simply spin webs of complex abstractions, the more far out the better. They make your head spin, but it's not the truth. Authentic truth means it's verifiable in your own experience. You first have to destroy the hallucination. That's why we're seemingly so negative here. Huh? It's like we're down on everybody, isn't it? Well, that's not exactly true. But what we want to do here is destroy the illusion that we think we know what reality is, or that we think we know what truth or authenticity or integrity are. Because we don't. Unless we find that truth in our own experience, it's not really ours. It's not really coming from our being. Real philosophy must be grounded in phenomenological, ontological inquiry into human beingness in the first person, as lived or on the field, rather than in the third person, as a spectator in the stands, or as theory and speculation. No one can tell you the truth. The truth is bigger than words. So we're not here to give you information. That's not what this course is about. This course is about giving you examples of things that you can then go verify in your own experience. Because only you can find out the truth by looking for yourself. And if you look for yourself, you'll see the things we're talking about. They're real. So we need a real philosophy that gives useful conclusions, not abstract, not phony, something we can base our actions on. So that's practical, that works, that lets us win, because that's what this is about. This is about being successful in a difficult time. The talking head philosophers don't verify their teachings by experience, because they can't. It's just a theory designed to disempower you and make you a slave. You really need to see that for what it is. I know it's uncomfortable, but don't worry. We're going to give you some positive things that you can base your real being on, and you'll see for yourself that those work. Exercises and questions. Exercises. Observe and verify in your own experience the following. Idle talk, compulsive curiosity, ambiguity due to groupthink, objectification, elementalism, ontological triples.